docela zvlastné. Takže tam jsem. Já děkuji za přednášku. Vy jste otevřel opět o, jak bude vypadat budoucí globální otroctví. Ještě stačí všechny očipovat a zrušit hotové peníze a bude to tady dokonal. Já bych se pomalej a nahlas. Můjte na testovat, to přikladám. Ještě jednou. Stačí ještě očipovat všechny občany a zrušit hotové peníze a bude dokonal. Já jsem se chtěl zeptat, myslíte si, že ty demonstrace těch lidí, kteří nemají na nic víc, něčemu pomohou? Já si myslím, že by bylo daleko lepší, aby všichni ti lidé, chtěl bych vyzvat, tady je hodně mladých, zatlačili na své vlády, aby o tom mohli rozhodovat občany. Plači to je správná demokracie. Jiní, když občané rozhodují o tak důležitých věcech. A bohužel, oni si to rozhodnou uplatnou malunitící nebo uplatní úřednící a my do toho nebudeme mít co mluvit. A to je katastrofa. I, yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. I completely agree with you. There are many different tactics to use. And for us, if you think back to the July vote in the European Parliament, where we had the split with the Social Democrats, our Social Democrats in the UK, the Labour Party, they said that they would only vote for TTIP. They would vote pro TTIP, pro TTIP, pro TTIP. And we had a national campaign of anger against those Social Democrat MEPs. And we forced them to change. Because we said to them, if you vote pro TTIP, don't come back to Britain, because we will roast you alive. <laughs> and that type of pressure on the politicians, I think, is really important. It's important to tell local politicians, because it's local government and local democracy which is also at threat. We were just talking earlier with some of the local members of the, of the, of the Deputy of Assemblies of, of Brno and saying to them, if they wish to introduce new terms and conditions on local government contracts, they could find that they also have infringed or, or, or violated the terms of the treaty. So I believe it should be at the local level, at the national level, but also, I think, very important at the European level. Why? Because the MEPs, the members of the European Parliament, usually have much less contact from the people of their country. And we know that for them, we can put more pressure on, particularly on the EU-Canada deal. You know, your MEPs, they know about these deals. Your local politicians don't. Your national politicians don't. But the European parliamentarians know about it. So I think, yes, put pressure on the government, put pressure on the MPs, and go on the streets as well. Well, so I'll turn back into English. <laughs> um, what, is, what is your feel about the European commissioners? Uh, because every state has nominated one commissioner into the commission. Is there a hundred percent consensus among the commissioners to be pro TTIP? Takže v podstatě by mě zajímalo, jestli tady je stoprocentní konsenzus mezi evropskými komisaři, tak aby všichni hlasovali nebo všichni jakoby prosazovali TTIP v rámci Evropy. It's a very good question because when we talk about the European Commission, we tend to talk about it as one thing, but it's not. It's split in lots of different directorates and each country nominates their person to be in charge of one branch. The health directorate of the European Commission is not pro TTIP because they realise that for health services this type of competition from your US corporations is no help at all. So they will say there's a problem with TTIP. Because if you look at the U.S. health system, we don't want that here. The U.S. health system is great if you're rich, and it's terrible if you're not rich. So they, the European Commission health specialists, will say that. Similarly, the ones dealing with edu education, or even maybe with agriculture, say that they don't really like it so much. The problem is that the people who are negotiating TTIP are the trade 
Directorate of the European Commission. So Malmström, Cecilia Malmström, is the Swedish commissioner in charge of the Trade Directorate. And this is the most powerful one. So they say, of course we're so interested in the environment. Of course we're interested in people. Of course we're interested in animals. But actually, we're interested in business. Because that's their mandate. Their mandate comes from business. And when you look at the number of lobby meetings that have taken place on TTIP, 90% are all of these big business lobbies working with that directorate against the other ones. So you're right, in principle, we could have a big battle between them. But in practice, it's ruled by the directorate on trade. Uh, you said that this situation is happening for the third time. There were two deals before this. So what, what is it you think that we can do to stop it completely? Because if yeah, this, yeah. this fails, uh, this deal fails, then uh, what, what is stopping the business from uh, uh, doing another one? Another one. situácia sa opakuje už tretí krát a že čo by sa dalo podniknúť proti tomu, aby sa takéto iniciatívy zastavili úplne? I mean, this is a really good question, and it's a question we keep asking ourselves as well. Every time we beat them, they come back. And we beat them, and they come back. And this is why a campaign on TTIP is only really a good mechanism for giving people an awareness of the bigger problem. They will keep coming back for as long as we elect politicians who are there to satisfy business first and people second. If you can find politicians which turn that round and put people's needs, social needs, environmental needs first, then you can get new types of trade deals. If we were negotiating TTIP with our sister organizations and our trade union friends in the USA, we would start in a different place. We'd say, okay, we're not against trade, but what type of trade do we want? We want to have less trade in this, more trade. We'd say we want less trade in oil, maybe more trade in environmentally friendly goods. We would do it in a completely different way. And we would have a different process, and we would have a different conclusion. But this comes to a question which is a deeper political question. And it's a question about the European Union. Because the European Union, I'm proud, I'm happy to be European. I don't want to just be British or English or from London. Or I'm happy to be European. But when you look at the structures of the European Union, the institutions of the European Union, and when for 20 years you try and change their policies and you can't do it because they keep on coming back, that's when you realize there's a deeper problem. And it's a problem of democratic legitimacy. And as we were saying earlier, in Britain, we're going to be offered a referendum in the next two years asking us, do we want to stay in the EU or do we want to leave the EU? And now it's about 50-50 as to people who want to stay and people who want to leave. So it's a really deep question and I think it comes down to politics. If you keep electing pro-capitalist politicians, you will get pro-capitalist trade deals. Thank you for the presentation. I would like to just ask, you say that the big planning to to lose the position, but I don't understand why, because I think that our liberalization of trade can support, uh, uh, to say, comparative advantage, and it should be to create a new, new job position. So it's my... This is the it's argument. Oh, sorry. I think that it's a proximity that it has to be a strategy for the liberalization of trade, which can be a new this is the traditional argument in favor of free trade. You're right, and it goes back to, I don't think you have David Ricardo here. I was going to see, no, it's good. It's much better to have these people, not David Ricardo. And um, you haven't even got Adam Smith, which is good. Um, but the principle of liberalization of trade leading to more jobs is actually not proven by history at all. And, and one of the interesting comparisons here is with the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. And this was signed in 1994 between the US, Canada and Mexico. And it's almost like the grandfather of all these bad deals. And Bill Clinton, when he was 
president of the USA, he promised to the workers of the USA that NAFTA would bring hundreds of thousands of new jobs for the reasons that you cite. You know, liberalization, comparative advantage, we will gain access to the Mexican markets, da da da. We now know, because we have 20 years of experience, NAFTA led to the net loss of 1 million US jobs. The high jobs went down to Mexico. They didn't stay in Mexico, they went to China after that. In Mexico, they lost 2 million jobs, particularly amongst the peasant farmers. And there, you think, David Ricardo and the theory of comparative advantage says nothing about these people's lives. It only talks about efficiency. These people were blown out of the water by the big industrial agriculture of Midwest USA. And it's not even that you lose one job here and you gain one job here, no. You lost two million jobs in Mexico. And those jobs are now being done by massive machines because efficiency turns those jobs into capital-intensive industries from being labor-intensive. The Canadians lost jobs as well as a result of NAFTA. So it was a lose, lose, lose when it came to labor and a win, win, win when it came to business. And I think that's how, for us, we don't want to see these trade deals in terms of international relations or US versus Mexico versus Canada, but in terms of political economy. Which of the different groups and classes in society benefit? And it's quite clear from these that the distribution of gains does not reach workers. Again, we said this to our own government. Our own government officials said, you know about Ricardo and the theory of comparative advantage. It's all going to be great. And we said to them, no, our experience is that when business in Britain does well, business in Britain does well. It doesn't mean anybody else does well. It just means that the people on the top get richer and richer. And we've seen the inequality gap as Britain has got richer. The inequality gap has gone like that. So all I would say is don't believe anything you learn in economics. <laughs> které budou samozřejmě obrovské, jsou obrovské, budou stále větší. Přispějí spíš zavření této smlouvy nebo spíš jenom zavření této smlouvy? Well, I think I have a different understanding of it. I mean, I think for me, the presence of refugees in Europe is a very positive thing. Because the presence of refugees in Europe is something which can contribute to our skills and our potential in the future. I do not see it as a negative thing from my side. I live in a country which has been crafted and, and formed by generation after generation after generation of immigrants. My own mother's family came from Germany in the 19th century. Everybody has come to my country, so it's, it's a different, perhaps, thought. Would you, would you say there's some link to the TTIP? But in terms of TTIP, in terms of this, I think the use, the, the link is in the geostrategic stuff. So when I go back to NATO, as well as the, the attempt to fight off Russia, the other attempt of NATO is to try and fight off the chaos in the Middle East. And so in that respect, if you believe in a strong NATO, then maybe TTIP is something you believe in. But I also come from a country which led the bombing of Iraq and as a strategy, a strategy of the UK and the US military forces in Iraq to turn the Sunni population against the Shia population and the Shia population against the Sunni population of Iraq. This was a strategic decision to create a communal war of people against people in Iraq in order to get rid of the problems of the occupation. Out of that crisis, Islamic State formed. Islamic State formed because they were able to use that crisis and they spread into Syria and it's as a result of that that we now have the refugee crisis. So for me, we need to rethink the imperialist adventures of NATO. NATO imperialism is not the answer. It's not the answer in Russia, it's not the answer in the Middle East and if you think that TTIP is good for NATO, 
then maybe that's another answer as to why these things are linked up. But they wanted TTIP well before the refugee crisis came. Yeah. I think this is a good question, not just about President Obama, but about all of our heads of state as well, about all of the, the leaders of our countries. And you might think, actually, for many of these people, they would realize that TTIP destroys their own power. It destroys the power of politicians because you're shifting power to the transnational capitalist class. But for late capitalist industrialized societies, like the USA, like most of the societies of Europe, the politicians seem to believe that the interests of capital and the interests of the state are one and the same. And I think that's where President Obama, he's part of a system which tells him that American business is the American way of life. And we had this discussion with our own minister, who, the minister in Britain who was responsible for promoting TTIP. I had a private meeting with him in his office earlier this year. And I said to him, Minister, how can you, before a deal like this, forget the business lobby, forget all the people who you work with there, what about the people of Britain? What do we have to see from this? Nothing. You know, even your own studies. The UK government did a study as to the costs and benefits, the cost-benefit analysis of introducing these new powers for US corporations. The study was the London School of Economics. So, you know, fairly good. They came back saying, benefits, zero. They came back saying, the benefits of this will be zero because no deal between the USA and another industrialized country has ever led to an increase in investment flows. Costs, huge. We're going to get hit by all of these lawsuits. So I said to our minister, why is it then that you're, you're promoting this? And he said, um, <laughs> it took him a long time. And he said, is this because we get that nice access to their markets for government procurement? I said, no, Minister, that's another bit of the deal altogether. He said, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and he couldn't come up with anything. In the end, what well, he said, if it's good for business, it's good for Britain. And that's the, the, the mentality of Obama. It's the mentality of all of our leaders. Because we live in a society where they cannot conceive of the interests of society as being different from the interests of big business. This isn't about small bits, this isn't about local shops. We like local shops, we like local jobs, we like these things. But this is about the big, big capital interests subordinating everything else. So maybe that's an answer. But I don't know President Obama personally, so I can only, <laughs> I only speculate. Um, but I'm pretty sure he faced these arguments, so he knows this. You know. Well, he, he, in, in, in the USA, they haven't really had such a big debate about TTIP. Their big debate has been about TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Because when the Americans look to Europe, they think we have nothing to fear. You know, the Europeans, they are, they're an aging continent, they're in decline, they'll probably disappear in a few years, and their standards are much higher than we have in the USA, so they're not worried. And they don't think they're going to lose jobs to us. They look towards Vietnam, which is one of the countries of TPP, and they're very scared because they can see all of the manufacturing jobs in the USA going to Vietnam. So that's where Obama has had to try and say, we will protect American jobs. And that's their answer. Sometimes the European Union has the same answer. We will put money to... Because they say, yeah, we, lots, lots of people will lose their jobs. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. They say that lots of people will lose their jobs. And, um, but they will put money into a fund which will then compensate. But, mm. That's really, that's the thing we're doing right now. It's working together with these small companies. We know several of them have come to us saying, we do not believe in TTIP. And we have real problems with the idea that 
it's just the big business lobby which is pushing it forward. And we're now preparing a website called Business Against TTIP, which will allow them to come up and say, and lots of people are now coming to us to speak about this. And we know um, Lush, the cosmetics company Lush, yeah? I know there has, there's one in Prague, but I don't know if there's one in Brno. There's no Lush shop. There's Lush soaps, they sell cosmetics. They've got 600 shops in Europe, so they're a big company. And they are against TTIP because they see the environmental and the social problems. In Germany and Austria, they have got really good campaigns with this already. They have websites, KMU gegen TTIP. If you speak German, but KMU gegen TTIP is in Austria and Germany, if you look for that. And they, each of them have 1,500, 1,600 companies which have signed up saying we are against TTIP. So it's a really important thing for us because then, if we can start showing that the small companies are worried and concerned about TTIP, then we can start making the argument to the, to the conservative politicians. Because the conservative politicians do not just want to be the parties of big business. So I think it's a really important strategic point to go to small businesses. The SPA, the, the um, supermarkets, which I believe used to be in, in, in Czech Republic, yeah, and now they've left. Or they anyway, SPA, the Austrian German supermarkets, they have taken out full page adverts in the Austrian newspapers, the Kronenzeitung, saying that they are against TTIP. Because they believe it will destroy the high quality Austrian agriculture. They've, they've put a lot of investment into high quality food. They believe TTIP will destroy that, and so they're against it. But if you look at that, we were just coming through um, the square in Brno and we went past the Zonentor. I think this is Austrian as well, the Zonentor? And so Mr. Zonentor is against TTIP. So you can find that on their website. <laughs> Ja sa chcem opýtať, pokiaľ by sa reálne stalo, že TT IP prejde a bude fungovať a následne prídu žaloby zo strany nadnárodných korporácií voči suverénnym štátom, akým spôsobom budú môcť tieto štáty jednať? Bude možné, aby tieto štáty jednoducho povedali nie, my to platiť nebudeme? Aká sila tieto štáty prinúti vlastne tieto sankcie nejakým spôsobom hodiť? Um, if you remember the case of Slovakia, the case of Slovakia, they said no, we don't want to pay the Dutch firm, and so the Dutch firm got the court in Luxembourg to say we will seize 30 million euros of the assets of the Slovakian people to pay the company. But a better example is Argentina. Argentina has been hit by more of these lawsuits than any other company, any other country in the world. And Argentina fought back against them really hard. And in the end, it was fighting and fighting and saying, we've lost, we've lost every single time, and we will, uh, you know, we refuse to pay. And at that point, the companies went to the USA, to the US government. The, the companies went to the US government, and they said, we want you to force Argentina to pay. And at that point, they said, okay. And we recognize we've lost. And they paid for the five cases, they paid $500 million dollars to settle the first five cases alone. And for Argentina, you know, you can do something with $500 million. Dollars. This is not nothing. So, unfortunately, force majeure comes into play. How could the US force them? I don't understand. Because you can say to them, look, you have a choice now. You either play the rules of the game, or we can cut off your, your access to our markets. We can turn you into North Korea if we want to. And the Argentine economy is very, very close to the US economy, so they have power over it. But ultimately, you know, you need to have more than one country which says no. And that's what's interesting at the moment. Many countries around the world are saying, we want no more of these deals. India has ripped up its deals and said, we will dis disqualify all of these companies from having access. Indonesia ripped them up. South Africa ripped them up. Brazil has refused even to start them. So there are lots of countries which are saying there is another way. We can make 
companies, foreign companies, use the same courts as domestic companies. What's wrong with our courts? And people like the Cecilia Malmström and Baron Obama know that when we say to them, do you think there's a problem with our courts? They say, no, we think you've got perfectly good courts. So they're very, very weak arguments on their side about this. But you need to have unity to be able to fight back. That's a very good question. And in, if I had a longer presentation, I could have talked about ACTA. ACTA, I don't know how many of you, you remember ACTA. It was the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. And in 2012, this was rejected by the European Parliament. This was amazing. It was a great campaign in the Czech Republic. In Poland, it was very, very big. In the UK, it was a very small campaign. We didn't really know about it. But it was about privacy and digital privacy, online privacy in Europe. And again, it's interesting to compare the European understanding of digital rights, our privacy online, with the understanding in the USA. In the USA, your data data about how you use the internet and everything, it is a commodity. It is something to be sold so that Google will know about it, Amazon will know about it, all of the big US firms will know about it, and they can use that information for commercial purposes. In Europe, there are restrictions on the access of companies to those type of information. So ACTA was rejected. Why was ACTA rejected? Well, the real reason ACTA was rejected at the European Parliament is because the European MEPs, the members of the European Parliament, they said that they had been excluded by a deal which was completely in secret. So they were really rebelling. It was their minor revolution against the process. TTIP does include a chapter on intellectual property rights. It does include a chapter on digital privacy. And there are lots of concerns that the US will again try to reintroduce some of the commercial aspects of ACTA. For example, can we have access for libraries over and above copyright rules, which has been something which has been negotiated for many years? They want to close down copyrights, make it more restrictive, so that libraries or disabled people will not have the same access. What about patents for generic drugs? This is really important. In Canada, as a result of the EU-Canada deal, they've had to add two years onto the life of patented drugs in the health system. And this will cost the Canadian health system hundreds of millions of dollars every year, simply so that they can give more profits to the big pharmaceutical industries. So these are the sorts of intellectual property issues which are coming back through TTIP. But we need to see the final thing before we know exactly how much of it is going to be actor by the back door.